Good morning, everybody. Wow. Um, welcome to CSIS. I am Jeff Mankoff, a senior fellow in our Russia and Eurasia program, and I will be moderating our discussion today on uh, US DPRK normalization, uh, which is not a topic I normally moderate discussions on. But uh, in this particular case, uh, it's very relevant to the work that our program does. Uh, our presenter is Anastasia Baranikova, who is currently a visiting fellow uh, in the Russia and Eurasia program here at CSIS, uh, and she is working on a report on this exact topic, which we will be publishing um, in, in the several, in a, in a while, let's say, in a while. Um, in her full-time role, um, Anastasia is a research fellow at the Admiral Nevelskoy Maritime State University uh, in Vladivostok in Russia, uh, and she's an expert on North Korea and uh, North Korean security policy. And she'll be talking to us about uh, US DPRK normalization, um, about the role of surrounding powers, including Russia, um, and giving her perspective and sort of the view from Russia uh, about what this relationship looks like and what the potential for normalization is. Um, then we have our discussant today, uh, Sharon Squassoni, whom many of you know, uh, who's currently a research professor at the Elliott School uh, of International Affairs at GW. Uh, she's a well-known expert here in Washington on nuclear energy, uh, arms control, uh, and disarmament, uh, and among a long history of uh, senior positions on this role, spent uh, a lot of time here at CSIS as well. Um, Anastasia's presentation, uh, which you can watch on the screen, uh, uh, it'll be about 30 minutes, then we'll have uh, Sharon provide a little bit of uh, discussion and context, and then we will open it up to all of you. Um, you can see the cameras, we're being recorded. This uh, will be available on the Russian Eurasia program website um, probably by tomorrow. Uh, it also means that we are on the record. Um, please silence your phones and other noise-making devices, and if there are no objections, I will give the floor to Anastasia. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining this event. Uh, normalization between the United States and North Korea has been topical for years, and last year it appeared that there was a real chance to move forward. But even the second summit between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un uh, finished with, uh, without any significant result, and there is still no progress in ongoing dialogue. But nevertheless, the dialogue should be continued. Otherwise, the, uh, the tensions can be renewed and uh, pose uh, threats to regional security. And the first one is clear. North Korea has nuclear and missile technologies. It has experience of conventional weapons sales. And it has gray and black channels, which are currently may be used for um, trade and can be redirected to proliferation. Uh, North Korea can be pushed to proliferation by external and internal factors. Uh, external factors include uh, renewed military threats by the United States or strengthened pressure by China. Internal factors uh, include economic development, which requires huge resources. North Korea doesn't have now. Uh, the second threat is possible degradation of United States ROK alliance. Uh, the was one of the biggest concerns among some experts was that uh, normalization between two countries will inevitably lead to withdrawal of United States troops from the territory of South Korea and uh, ultimately to degradation of alliance. Um, it is uh, absence of uh, lack of progress in negotiations which can lead to this collapse. Inability to achieve progress in negotiations with North Korea may be more likely cause. <clears throat> Uh, indeed, possession of nukes by North Korea is not uh, so dangerous as uh, hostile, hostile relations with North Korea. And the United States' image of superpower can be uh, tarnished if it's unable to come to an agreement with a uh, nuclear state in Asia. It can potentially push uh, its Asian allies to seek their own nuclear deterrence for self-defense. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, it should be remembered that uh, both ROK and Japan 
already conducted the nuclear um, programs in the past, and now they have all necessary economic, technological, and scientific capabilities to develop nuclear weapons in the short term. They just need political will to transfer their nuclear programs to military footing. Uh, the next threat is uh, further strengthening of China's monopoly. China has almost restored its influence on North Korea, lost after execution of Chan Sun Tech, uh, who was considered China's agent of influence. After adoption of United Nations Resolution Number uh, 2375, China almost monopolized foreign and trade ties with North Korea. Uh, some South, South Korean experts uh, dealing with relations between China and North Korea for a long time raised concerns that uh, China can ultimately make North Korea its economic province, political protectorate, or even annex. <clears throat> These assumptions are quite controversial. On the one hand, even when China's economic influence grows, the record suggests that North Korea retains uh, an independent foreign domestic policy. On the other hand, it's only logical that the strengthening of unilateral influence of any country, including China, could impact the foreign policy of North Korea, including its current dialogues with the United States and ROK. And along with North Korea, China strengthens influence on South Korea as well. As a result, it is now considered as <clears throat> the most influential country in the region. And uh, the next threat is decrease of role of sanctions as a tool of foreign policy. Sanctions imposed under the latest resolution, 2375, have certainly affected welfare of ordinary people in North Korea and <clears throat> activities of humanitarian agencies and foundations. But sanctions produced no impact on the sphere they were initially targeting, North Korean nuclear and missile program. North Korean experience and unchanged position <clears throat> could become another encouraging model for other countries uh, which are currently under UN or US sanctions. And it certainly further decreases the efficiency or at least perception of efficiency of sanctions as a tool of foreign policy. At the same time, if the dialogue evolves and brings some results, there are a number of prospects. Uh, first, <clears throat> both South Korea and Japan consider the rem removal of uh, so-called North Korean threat by peaceful means, the most optimal path. It is not surprising considering uh, this country's proximity to North Korea and presence of United States bases on their territories. In the case of conflict, these bases could become targets for North Korean missiles. If United States could establish peace on the Korean Peninsula by normalizing bilateral relations, it would only strengthen alliance. Uh, the alliance between the United States and ROK has been a successful one because it never remained static. In response to changing security environment, changes were made to annual military exercises, tasks, and number of troops. And these changes did not lead to collapse of alliance. The same would not hold true for the United States DPRK normalization. <clears throat> Uh, it can be said uh, that any future government in Seoul, regardless of its policy or ideology, would be interested in an alliance with the United States in some form, as it serves a hedge against Japan and China. Mm. As, uh, <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, the bilateral alliance is in need of an update to its mission and structure to meet new geopolitical environment. Otherwise, it risks playing a stabilizing role in the Korean Peninsula that contradicts its very purpose. Modernization would maintain its relevance, value, and would be appreciated by allies and would help the United States to strengthen its positions in the region. Today, the main purpose of an alliance is deterrence of China, so it doesn't make sense to put this alliance at risk by maintaining tensions in relations with North Korea. And as for United States troops in the South, North Korea made it clear in the past uh, that it is ready to accept their long-term presence. And position of North Korea will har hardly change, as Pyongyang also considers military presence of United States as a geopolitical hedge against Chinese and possibly Russian influence. And modernization of the alliance would lay the ground for new security mechanism in Northeast Asia. Uh, it's notable that uh, a special advisor to South Korean president told uh, during the last summit that North Korea ca can ultimately become military ally of United States. Um, 
Now, North Korea made it clear that uh, there are no eternal enemies. The idea of that level of cooperation may seem fantastical, but it is not new and has already attracted attention of experts. And particularly, uh, William McKinney, who served uh, in the Korean Peninsula Energy Development Organization in North Korea, proposed in his article idea of building United States ROK DPRK triangular partnership uh, relationship. Uh, the author recommends United States to shift from the current line separating North Korea and China from South Korea and the United States. Rather, the United States should befriend and actively work to empower both North and South Korea to balance against China. In this way, the United States could uh, more actively and positively shape the future of Northeast Asian region. But to make it possible, the United States uh, should not just make peace with North Korea, but also build a kind of constructive, constructive relationship with Pyongyang. The refusal of the United States to normalize relations with the DPRK could lay the groundwork for China DPRK ROK triangle. Uh, the next uh, option uh, prospect is participation of the United States in economic projects on the Korean Peninsula. It's not a secret that there are uh, businessmen in the United States, ROK, and uh, European countries which are waiting for sanctions relief in order to start business with North Korea. Uh, this country, rich in natural, biological, and human resources, seems prospective market, and now it is being transformed. Uh, gradual normalization between uh, United States and North Korea would make it possible for American businessmen to work there constantly, and it would allow them uh, United States to spread soft power and serve as a security guarantee for North Korea. Uh, indeed, the United States will not uh, attack North Korea if there are Americans on its territory. It would also partial, partially compensate the absence of diplomatic relations between two countries. Another option is participation of United States in so-called trans-Korean projects of economic cooperation implemented by Russia and both Korean states. Uh, these projects uh, have not only economical importance, but also can promote inter-Korean rapprochement and integration, and thus have peacekeeping potential. Participation of the United States in these projects would not only help to interact with both states of Korean Peninsula, but also would become one of the few points of contact with Russia. Now let's consider the main obstacles to normalization. First of all, these are different positions of the main participants. The position of North Korea can be considered as proactive. Uh, North Korea, feeling an urgent need for changes, started restoring and developing its diplomatic and foreign relations. And the results to date are impressive. They include numerous summits. Uh, Kim Jong-un has skillfully played a, posi a position of interest between the United States and China. Uh, North Korea sought a rapprochement with China as a leverage to bring Trump to the negotiating table. And in the same way, North Korea used the dialogue with the United States to put pressure on China. Along with dialogue uh, with the United States, North Korea actively developed inter-Korean relations. And these events forced China to intensify its North Korean diplomacy. North Korea has reminded China of its strategic importance. As for China, it seems to take reactive position. North Korea is of particular interest to China, both as a buffer territory and bargaining chip in negotiations with the United States. And faced with an uh, American president willing to talk with North Korean leader, China felt the need to restore its influence of, on North Korea. At the same time, uh, while China considers the Korean Peninsula as its sphere of influence, it is not interested in any significant changes. It benefits from maintaining status quo, permanent tension without worsening or improving situation. For this reason, China would not favor North Korea establishing closer ties with the United States or ROK. It will seek to control or interfere into current dialogue processes. Experts point that even during the first summit of Trump and Kim, Beijing was the third virtual participant in the negotiations. And agreement uh, reached in Singapore for all its vagueness uh, is, was fully in China's interest. The same can be said about the second summit, which finished with no result but uh, with a door opened for a dialogue. Uh, as for the United States, their position also seems reactive. Current dialogue with North Korea appears to reprise situation of the past when inter-Korean rapprochements and the threat of changes in the region resulted in the United States opening to a dialogue with North Korea. 
North Koreans uh, always responded to these signals and made attempts to normalize relations, but these efforts failed. With the Trump presidency, there is a possibility of changes, though United States strategy still appears uh, to rely upon Cold War approaches. It's possible that Donald Trump has his own vision of development of relations with the DPRK, but it uh, should be remembered that he does, does not have, he may not have the same power in the United States as Kim Jong-un in the DPRK. Another obstacle to achieving agreement between the United States and North Korea is obvious divergence between their official and real goals in the dialogue. Official declared goals uh, are well known. It is uh, denuclearization in exchange of uh, security guarantees for DPRK. We will not spend time on official concepts. Uh, they are also well known. CVID model. Uh, United States insists on its CVID model. North Korea insists on its own CVID model, uh, providing for denuclearization of Korean Peninsula. Uh, approaches proposed by experts seem more flexible and interesting. They are managing deterrence. <clears throat> this approach is aimed uh, not uh, at elimination of North Korean nuclear weapon, but uh, at its uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, limitation. Roadmap of Siegfried Hacker uh, offers uh, um, not de denuclearization, but demilitarization of uh, North Korean nuclear and missile programs. And the model proposed by Chinese scholars, uh, which uh, provides uh, living in North Korea with a small amount of nuclear weapon. Uh, each of the considered uh, approaches has uh, its weaknesses and strengths, but they have common drawback. Uh, only North Korea is considered as the object of denuclearization, which contradicts the very concept of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And it should be noted that none of these approaches takes into account the motivational factors for North Korea to possess nuclear weapons <coughs> and its strategic goals. There are different approaches to assessing motivations behind North Korean nuclear program. North Korea is an isolated state, hyper-realist state, and revision state. Um, in my opinion, North Korea is surely a real state. If we compare uh, statements of its le leadership uh, and uh, its official statements in um, state media with uh, the main basics of approach to foreign relations, um, political realism, we see that they have much in common. Um, as for motives, motivations to possess nuclear weapons, researchers dealing with uh, this issue single out the following factors motivating all countries to develop nuclear weapons. Security considerations of status and prestige, internal factors, and factor of technical progress. Uh, for North Korea, a full set of motivating factors uh, would uh, look like this. Uh, now we see that even the most flexible approaches to denuclearization do not consider these factors. They provide a compensation for North Korean nuclear weapons as a means of security only. But what about other functions of this weapon? What about prestige, ideology, regime survivability, and inability to counter potential enemy by conventional weapons? How can it be compensated, and will it be compensated? And uh, since nuclear deterrent has been created for achieving certain geopolitical goals, it's logical that North Korea can give it up only after having achieved these goals. Uh, what are these goals? Let's try to understand it. <coughs> reunification is undoubtedly one of them. But reunification by force or via absorption of one system by another is impossible and technically unfeasible. It is well understood both in South and North Korea. North Korea has its own vision of reunification, unchanged for decades, one nation, two systems uh, concept. It's rather coexistence and cooperation of two independent countries than unification. However, it can promote integration processes and ultimately lead to establishing one political system on the peninsula, the most attractive for Koreans. And the important moment, Korean Peninsula should be neutral in its foreign policy. It was first pointed by Kim Il-sung when he proposed the idea of Korea Confederation. And we can suggest that uh, Kim Jong-un, while studying in Switzerland, uh, got interested in historical experience of this country as a neutral state. If Korea, <coughs> excuse me, 
had a <coughs> status of neutral state in the past century, then the Korean War and <coughs> division of the Korean Peninsula could be avoided. Even now, both Korean states are actively involved in geopolitical games of big powers, and <coughs> Korea has historically been a strategic pawn in confrontation of these powers. But thanks to nuclear weapons, North Korea got the opportunity to become a strategic rook in the end game. Uh, those who play chess know that uh, castle or rook are considered the strongest uh, chess pieces in the in eight end game <coughs> in longer term prospect. Um, of course, North Korean chances to find this place under the sun have increased, but in order to achieve strategic goals, it needs its nuclear potential, which has already proved as an official t tool of foreign policy. What are the real interests of big powers? Recent dialogues show that uh, countries concerned intentionally repeat the mistakes of the past. <clears throat> it's unlikely that United States leadership was not aware of the position of North Korea on denuclearization. And uh, refusal... <coughs> Excuse me. A refusal of North Korea to make unilateral concessions without any reliable, <laughs> without a, a, any reliable guarantees also was expectable. Uh, these approaches could be justified uh, in, in the beginning of 2000s when North Korea did not have nuclear weapons but had serious problems in economics and uh, could make some concessions. But now using old approaches uh, looks strange. There are two possible explanations. First, big powers ignore uh, shifting balance in Northeast Asia and continue considering the world unipolar or bipolar. And uh, second, big powers see all changes but try to postpone them in order to maintain status quo. And important point, North Korean uh, regime and its uh, de facto nuclear status are integral parts of this status quo. That's why denuclearization cannot be the real goal of big powers and consequences of the nuclearization would be more serious than those of emergence of new nuclear state. Uh, another problem is the dialogue format. Uh, bilateral dialogue seems the most efficient for normalization of bilateral relations, but its implementation is difficult to, due to interests of the third parties. The dialogue between the United States and North Korea has, br has brought no results so far. And one of the reasons uh, is active interference of internal and external forces. In the United States, maybe hardliners or political opponents of Trump made their best not to let, let Trump make concessions to Kim, Kim and made him change decisions in the last moment. As for North Korea, it's more complex. Uh, there is no domestic political struggle for the moment. So just external factors could influence its position on negotiation. There is one country which could do it. China. <clears throat> in contrast to the United States, where open campaign and media were carried out during the summit preparation, China's interference was uh, silent and more difficult to prove. But it has certainly taken place. Uh, in this case, bilateral talks are not bilateral, and in order to achieve progress removal of at least one interference factor is needed. <clears throat> uh, negotiations with <clears throat> Mediator could be another option. Excuse me. <clears throat> as we know, South Korean government has already played a positive role and proved efficient as mediator. Observers call Winter Olympic Games uh, Winter Political Games. And importantly, South Korean government is really interested in normalization between the United States and North Korea. As for, uh, as for an alternative mediator, it should be noted that not, no country in the region is really interested in this normalization, except perhaps neutral countries like Mongolia and Russia. Mongolia has uh, much in common with North Korea from the point of geostrategic geopolitical position in Asia, maintains traditional good relations, and uh, Mongolia uh, positions itself as a neutral and efficient platform for uh, different uh, international negotiations. Uh, as for Russia, uh, on the one hand, Russia seems to, play, uh, to take passive position in the Korean Peninsula. On the other hand, uh, the PRK considers active policies as aggressive and expensive, and Russia's passivity uh, may have certain advantages. Russia doesn't have much leverage on North Korea and avoids any attempts to interfere in its internal affairs, so Pyongyang doesn't consider Russia as an external threat. From this point, uh, Russia seems an attractive mediator uh, who is trusted by North Korea. <clears throat> uh, al 
also uh, at the current stage, uh, this rule, possible rule of Russia, is hampered by tensions in Russia-United States relations. The worse the relations of Russia with the United States and the West, the closer its relations with China, and the stronger its support of China's policy on the Korean Peninsula. For more active involvement of Russia in promoting and facilitating dialogue between the United States and the PRK, uh, substantial warming on, of Moscow's relations with Washington is needed. To sum up, normalization between the United States uh, and the PRK is not only possible, but uh, also meets the interests of both countries. But uh, it would require a uh, revision of the current dialogue agenda and strategy of the United States. These changes uh, can include, but are not limited to. You can see them on the slide. The first one means uh, that uh, it's necessary to revise Cold War and Unipolar War strategies and the role of Korean Pen North Korea. North Korea can not only play the role uh, of a buffer, but also can act in the interests uh, of the United States, if the latter will respect and take into account in its interests. Uh, the second one means that uh, different approaches should be applied to military and uh, citizen programs of North Korea. Denied, denying its right to peaceful atom and space programs not only violates international laws, but <clears throat> does not promote trust building between two countries. Uh, normalization instead of normalization before denuclearization. Uh, denuclearization of North Korea is possible only as a result of inter-Korean integration and cooperation with the United States in security, so it is a long-term goal. But in order to achieve, or at least to, to start achieving this goal, normalization should go first at bilateral negotiations. Engagement instead of pressure. <coughs> It is clear that uh, lack of understanding and trust is a natural result of absence of any cultural, economic, diplomatic ties between two countries. In order to start normalization, at least development of humanitarian cooperation is needed. Adjustments instead of concessions. The very word, uh, word concessions is negatively perceived by all countries. While adjustments uh, seem more harmless and allow countries to adjust the means of achieving their strategic goals, uh, then deviate from them. Uh, for example, freezing uh, United States ROK exercises is a concession, while changing agenda of these exercises would be an adjustment. Uh, bilateral, in, bilateralism instead of multilateralism, <coughs> it, it's clear, or at least neutral mediators. And the uh, final, uh, managing uh, risk instead of avoiding risk. As experts of Stanford uh, CISAC point, the United States diplomacy since uh, 2000 has been sporadic, reactive, and often motivated by desire to avoid risk instead of manage risk. It is true for United States North Korean policy. United States react into Korean rapprochement, nuclear and missile tests by North Korea, but still refuses to be proactive and change its strategy on the DPRK. If the United States continues this line, another country, say China, can head the processes in the region and in the Korean Peninsula in particular. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Anastasia. Uh, let me pass the floor now to Sharon. I don't have any prepared remarks, but I do have tons of questions because <laughs> your presentation um, is so interesting and provides such a different perspective than we often get here in Washington. So first, um, full disclosure, I do believe the Mongolians are a good uh, mediator uh, because the Mongolians actually introduced Anastasia and and me uh, a couple years ago, and um, thus started some of this um, collaboration. I have, instead of prepared comments, um, some big questions, and I hope that maybe I can ask them of you. We can have a little bit of a dialogue, and then open the floor um, to all of your questions, because this looks like a pretty expert audience to me. Um, so I have a few big questions. Uh, one is, is denuclearization really possible? And you seemed to suggest that the Chinese don't believe that 
denu or at least this, the Chinese scholars uh, think that we may be able to reduce risk from uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons. Um, in your big points, one of them was normalize, not denuclearize. I don't know if that, you know, in a, in a U.S., uh, looking through a U.S. frame, and also another full disclosure, I'm a nonproliferation person, so <laughs> I view these issues in a, in a particular way. Um, I think the Trump administration has been fairly clear that denuclearization has to happen, you know, if not yesterday, then next week. I think most of us understand that's a little unrealistic, but somewhere there's a range. So um, d do you think that denuclearization is really possible if North Korea has, as you said, has a lot of different motivating factors, they've put nuclear weapons in their doctrine, they see nuclear weapons as pretty much you know, changing the Northeast Asia security environment. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that? <coughs> Uh, of course, I, I think it is possible, but uh, as I say, not in our life, <laughs> because it will require first the inter-Korean reintegration, which will be prevented by, actively by different countries in the region, and uh, cooperation in the sphere of security with the United States. It's very difficult. It, it will take a lot of time, because two countries which opposed each other, they will have to find ways to cooperate in such sensitive sphere as security. And of course, working with both Korean states is needed in this case. As for Chinese scholars, yes, they do not believe in denuclearization, maybe because they do not believe in reunification. And they, I heard such opinion of Chinese scholars that Stable North Korea is uh, more preferable than uh, denuclearized North Korea. So if uh, it needs nuclear weapons to guarantee its stability, China can get used to it. So one of the challenges <laughs> in my long career in nonproliferation is convincing other countries, you don't need nuclear weapons for security. And certainly, um, some of your comments about further proliferation, right? The fact that South Korea, uh, m and more is the case for Japan, has a latent nuclear weapons capability, right? They have uranium enrichment, they have spent fuel repressing. It wouldn't be a huge jump for them uh, in terms of technical capabilities. Politically, it would be a huge jump. But so, doesn't North Korea, or I, I guess maybe uh, the U.S. isn't doing such a great job, Japan and South Korea are two examples of countries that have strong alliances with the U.S., no nuclear weapons. Um, so why doesn't, uh, it, it seems hard for me to understand that North Korea would want to live in a, in a Northeast Asia where South Korea and, and North Korea, uh, sorry, South Korea and Japan suddenly developed nuclear weapons. So that's one point. But the other, the other point is that here are two countries which are economically very successful, more or less, uh, have strong alliances with the U.S. There are good examples of countries without nuclear weapons that have done well. So how to get, um, you know, how would the U.S. get at this point about prestige of nuclear weapons and the fact that this isn't really going to help North Korea. <laughs> I, I'm afraid uh, <clears throat> a nuclear weapon will stop being a symbol of prestige if all countries will become nuclear. But I hope it will no, never occur. Uh, as for uh, nuclear weapon, possible going nuclear uh, by South Korea, uh, <clears throat> there was an interesting statement by North Koreans after conducting first state that our nuclear weapon will be common for all Koreans. And some South Korean experts even point that uh, North Korean nuclear weapon will be common for Korean nation. <laughs> I heard such opinions. 
That, that would create a huge problem for the non-proliferation treaty. <laughs> uh, yes, but it is, again, it is possible just after reunification in any form. And reunification is very rem distant uh, prospect. Um, I had a very kind of narrow question. Um, you quoted Kim Jong-il about um, the presence of, from 2000, about the potential presence of U.S. troops on the peninsula after reunification. That was pre-nuclear weapons, right? Their first test was in 2006. Um, do you think Kim Jong-un has a different view, perhaps? Uh, I don't see any reasons for him to require removal of United States troops. Uh, they re require just removal of nukes, because North Koreans still do not believe that uh, United States withdrew uh, all tactical nuclear weapons from the South. And they need a legal guarantee of, um, to prevent uh, uh, redeployment of these nuclear weapons there. As for United States troops, they really can consider it as a geopolitical hedge against the influence of big neighbors. I mean, United States troops can, can deter influence of China and possibly Russia in future. Do, do I have the liberty to ask a few more questions? <laughs> so some of these are, are, are uh, disparate. I have a whole page here. Um, you mentioned Chinese interference in the summit process. Can you talk a little bit more about that, what um, China might have done, and what uh, motivated China in that regard? As I already told, China is interested in status quo, which means uh, no improvements in relations between North Korea and the United States. And China has uh, different leverages, uh, I mean, economic leverages on North Korea. And uh, I have very big doubts about uh, North Korean envoy to negotiations. What if he was uh, agent of influence of China? And uh, last year... Do we have any evidence or indication that he is? Uh, unfortunately, no, just my own opinion. Nobody will ever confirm this information. <laughs> Maybe later when it will become history. But uh, as I told, uh, there is no political struggle currently in North Korea. It is uh, proved by the fact that a uh, leader can leave country for several days for a foreign trip. <clears throat> it means that the uh, regime is stable, no conflicting fac fractions inside the country. So just external factor could interfere, could influence the position of North Koreans. Okay, if you <clears throat> would indulge me, I have two more questions, sure. but these are not about your presentation, but more coming from Vladivostok. Um, you have a particular perspective. You're much closer um, to the region. I would say the U.S. perception, and some, some of your comments about sanctions led me to, or raised this question for me. The U.S. perception is that North Korea is extremely isolated. But coming from the region, it, I kind of have the hunch that you don't see them as isolated as we do. Is that the case? Because, you know, you talked about sanctions um, affecting, uh, you know, trade relations, you know, the, the, the exertion of soft power on North Koreans. So, could you just talk a little bit about how your view from from your geopolitical perch uh, might differ? How, in your view, how, you know, is North Korea not as isolated as we think they are? I think influence of sanctions is noticeable in the far east of Russia only, <laughs> because we lose, uh, <clears throat> we have almost lost this uh, workers uh, engaged in construction sector and <clears throat> North Korean restaurants close. But uh, it is not, the situation is not the same in China. <clears throat> there are some reports that China continues this cooperation. And uh, from North Korea itself, uh, visitors to this country noticed that uh, sanctions didn't influence on its econo economy. It influenced only on 
uh, some groups of people, welfare and <clears throat> maybe uh, on prices for some goods. But these goods are still supplied and <laughs> it's impossible to um, uh, <laughs> uh, It's difficult to track the channels. But uh, as for Russia, yes, uh, far, far east of Russia was uh, the only region who suffered from sanctions. Not uh, Russia as a whole, because uh, the share of trade with North Korea was very small, even before sanctions. But uh, in Far East, it's very noticeable. And, and then one last question, since you've been in Washington for a few months. Um, what has struck you about what did you think was odd or strange about U.S. perceptions of North Koreans or the situation there? <laughs> I, I, I don't want to offend. Um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, uh, f uh, my first impression that uh, concerning North Korea um, United States is very isolated, I mean, uh, informationally. So, yes, it, it so it, it, <laughs> uh, its approach uh, is uh, the same like a Cold War approach, so it's very old, and I, I don't understand why it hasn't, hasn't developed. <laughs> so, so yeah. you, you, when you say U.S. is isolated in information. You mean that we are not uh, getting a lot of information as if, uh, about North Korea? United States is in a vacuum <laughs> concerning North Korea only, of course. Maybe because of its remoteness, some people even don't know where is North Korea located on the map. <laughs> some people don't know where Mexico is. <laughs> <laughs> um. But at the same time, uh, experts in the United States are very flexible, and the most interesting idea I have found here while uh, reading articles by experts. But unfortunately, like, experts are not listened to by governments. <laughs> I think everywhere, not just here. OK, thank you both. I think we've opened up a lot of avenues for discussion. Um, I know there's a lot of expertise in the room, and I'd like to take advantage of it. So at this point, I'm going to open the floor up to questions. Uh, please wait to be recognized. Um, you'll get a microphone and uh, speak into the microphone, be brief, and please ask a question rather than make a long declamatory statement. So Richard. Thank you, Richard White's Hudson Institute. So I agree with Sharon when you had the chart about South Korean and Japanese capabilities. Um, they're much f further behind in some respects because that was just a, basically to build a weapon. Not They haven't been able to develop or practice launchers concepts and so on. And more importantly, they don't have the incentive. The U.S. has been good about giving them other means of assuring their security so they don't need them. That was just my comment. My question for you is Russia and China have been promoting this three-step peace plan. You know, first, you have a cessation of North Korean nuclear missile tests and cessation of large U.S. exercises. The next phase is a series of bilateral meetings, particularly between the head of the United States and the head of North Korea, but also between North Korea and, pres and the president of Russia and so on. And th we've made, s we've gone through those. We're now then going to need to go to the third phase according to this model of re or rebuilding this multilateral structure to embed some of these processes. So I was curious how you would assess the implementation of the peace plan. Do you think this is what we're following and what you saw might come further? Thank you. Uh, excuse me, you, you uh, asked about multilateralism, yes? Mm -hmm. um, yes, multilateralism may be useful in some cases, but uh, I see a negative example of six-party talks, because uh, every country, when there are more than two countries or more than three countries, pursues uh, its own interests and uh, ultimately the negotiations turn into a platform for 
um, putting claims to each other on different questions. So bilateral relations between United States and North Korea should be improved bilaterally, or at least with neutral mediator, but not in uh, the same format as six-party talks. Otherwise, it, they can become as uh, crawfish, uh, swan, and pike <laughs> from uh, Krylov's fable. <laughs> you know, maybe this Russian fable. Uh, of course, there are different uh, layers and uh, levels. Uh, peace building on the Korean Peninsula, of course, w would require uh, participation of all countries concerned, uh, concerned but, uh, and uh, peace treaty, con concluding peace treaty, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, China all, also t took part in Korean War, and Russia, though unofficially, all these countries took part unofficially, but they took part. So they should uh, take part in signing final draft of peace treaty. But as for normalization, uh, uh, your question about, uh, I'll make it clear later. As for normalization between the United States and DPRK, just bilateralism is good, uh, to my, in my opinion. Um, yeah, here. Uh, Victor D. from Global Peace Foundation. I have two questions, actually. One about uh, Korean and uh, about Mongolia. And uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, differentiation rather than unification of uh, Korea. And, uh, and then also you talk about it would be a distant thing in instead of immediate uh, uh, possibility. But uh, recently, Kim Jong-un he talked to regional party leaders and military leaders. He said unification have to happen by 2020, no matter what. And then also the South Korean government asked scholars to study about confederation idea. It's like a U European Union, uh, that kind of way of uh, a possibility of unification, scenario of unification. So what if, if those both sides wants to go that way, and uh, so what will, uh, how do you see how serious they are? And uh, what will be Russians' uh, position on this? And uh, how likely the relevant countries support that kind of idea? Uh, that's one. And about Mongolia, it top, Mongolia is a kind of convenient, uh, neutral platform for people to convene. That's, that's it, Mongolia wants to do that, and uh, it's their goal. But however, uh, uh, former President Elbeduj, he went to North Korea, he tried to pro, uh, promote democracy there, and uh, Mon he probably wanted to see Mongolia as uh, could be an example for Korea, North Korea and transition to democracy without nuclear weapon and promote uh, the whole kind of regional nuclear free kind of region. How do you see that kind of transition into a nuclear free democracy? Uh, that kind of a possibility, and then if yes, uh, uh, under what condition can can happen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've almost forgot the first question. <laughs> Unification. Unification by 2020. Uh, I think it is the same like uh, the конец света. Как будет конец света? At the end of the world. The end of the world by this year. By <laughs> so it's uh, very difficult to predict. But uh, if to take uh, as a basis this concept of reunification, I mean, uh, not reunification, but cooperation, integration, it has already been implemented now. Uh, the next question is uh, uh, who will replace uh, Moon Jae-in on his post? Maybe uh, sometimes uh, if a new president comes to South Korea, uh, foreign policy turns very sharply, uh, including North Korean policy. Uh, and of course, uh, there are um, not so many countries interested in uh, inter-Korean inter rapprochement. I don't uh, use the word reunification, and they will prevent it. As for Mongolia example, yes, it's very interesting. Uh, as you know, Mongolia has its concept of the third neighbor. Uh, North Korea could borrow this concept. Maybe it has already done it, because it tries to play between big powers uh, without uh, making uh, any preference. <laughs> uh, 
But as for democracy, I I don't understand what what does the, does any country has democracy at all, and why North Korea should change its efficient regime? <laughs> and as for non-nuclear uh, status, um, it would be possible if uh, concept of Northeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone project uh, realized, implemented, but. It, there are too many opposers to this project. And it is not North Korea who sh should start a disarmament. Hi. Thank you. I'm James Martone from Sky News Arabia. And I'm not an expert, just a journalist. But I wanted to ask, um, with regards to that in America we see things differently perhaps than someone like yourself or people closer to North Korea. I mean the perception here is that the North Korean leader is completely off the wall, megomaniac, does whatever he wants, no one controls him. So with that in mind, I mean is, and, and some people might argue that in America, we have a similar situation, but in America, there are people around the president that can that do have influence. Whereas in North Korea, the perception from here is that it's one man rules all. So, I mean, how serious is it to believe that, you know, one can negotiate with the leader of North Korea, that he'll follow through on on, on promises? Are there people that he is accountable to? I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this case, negotiations will be effective just uh, if two leaders <laughs> negotiate, leader to leader. That's why North Koreans, uh, I think, take seriously just Trump, but not his advices. All other persons can be replaced. Uh, they are not cons constant, <laughs> something constant. Uh, if uh, it is Kim Jong-un who negotiates, uh, he should negotiate with Trump only. There's no options. Of course, they understand that uh, uh, re reality is different uh, in the United States, and Trump is not the only person who takes this, makes decisions. Uh, but uh, they still make attempts <laughs> to talk with Trump only. I, I think the question was more if the US does negotiate with Kim, mm. how much confidence can it have that any agreements that it reaches will be implemented? Mm-hmm. Если будут осуществлять, если будут осуществлять, если да, ну будет ли возможно, uh -huh. Uh -huh. если не будут писать, это в США со стороны советников, там, да? Это, ну потому что Ким такой человек и не боятся к его власти, и что uh -huh. было бы возможно быть уверенным в каких-либо соглашениях. Окей, uh, okay. I hope I understand this question. Mm. But uh, I don't think that Kim Jong-un is less reliable than uh, American president. <laughs> I, I think they uh, have much in common. Uh, and if uh, they agreed, uh, this, all agreements could be implemented if uh, the positions is not influenced by other forces. I, I mean, United States and, uh, and China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, my English is not so good, so maybe I didn't understand. But uh, the other thing, sometimes uh, uh, North Korea is told to make promises which uh, it never made. <laughs> so it's, uh, for example, when uh, North Korea was talking about the democratization of Korean Peninsula, media wrote about the democratization of North Korea. So it is, it is not good because uh, it creates uh, false expectations and when these expectations are not met, it creates tensions in relations. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, so the qu 
question of whether leaders will follow agreements is, is a good one. Um, and that's why um, some people think we should have treaties. And um, even then, some countries do not always adhere to treaties. But I mean, that's why we have this, you know, um, rule of law. So um, it's a funny situation where you have a leader who we believe, Kim Jong-un, is very much in control of his country and doesn't have a lot of, you know, ca can make decisions. Um, but in the past, that country has, has reneged and violated agreements. Uh, we can argue about whether, you know, there were misunderstandings over those things. But, you know, I, I used to negotiate for the U.S. government. You, you know, that's why you have negotiating histories. And obviously some things can fall through the cracks. On the other hand, we have a, a U.S. president who has other constraints on him but is quite capable of kind of turning on a dime and deciding to do good things or bad things on any given day. So. In the end, dialogue, I believe, is really critical as we go forward, but it's not enough. Uh, it, and it's not enough for North Korea to take certain transparency and confidence building steps, for example, shutting down its nuclear test site. Well, that's very nice, but um, <laughs> that doesn't guarantee that it will never test nuclear weapons again, right? So both sides, need to see it in their interest to adhere to or to write agreements, have verification or some kind of monitoring. And actually, you know, more than bilateral is quite useful, as we have seen with the Iran nuclear deal, where even though the U.S. has decided, for whatever reasons, to get out of it, the other parties see, uh, you know, a need to stay in the agreement. Um, so, you know, will we get there with North Korea? That's a good question. But that rule of the law um, is critical in my view. And I would just make a comment on the previous question, this, this issue of confederation. Um, however unification, whatever form unification, if it happens or confederation happens, I have a hard, you know, like the Swiss Republic is a confederation, right? <laughs> you know? I mean, people, when you have a confederation, you have a lot of um, agreement on how things happen. And I just, at this point, can't see South Korea, which has a, quite a vibrant democracy, um, and North Korea, which, and I take your point, democracies are, you know, n they're, they're, they're no perfect democracies. But North Korea is just so far away from that that I would see, I, you know, I don't know if I can trust Kim Jong-un's um, you know, points about unification, I think he would have a heart attack when he saw exactly what, you know, accountability means. I hope he gets there, but um, we're, we're not anywhere close. Anyway, sorry for going on. But. You know, to have to think about historical examples of confederations or federations between countries with such radically different political systems. Maybe, maybe it's possible. Yeah. Um, over here. Okay, um, my name is Sang Min Lee. I'm a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. I have a question about uh, North Korea Kim Jong Un visit to um, Russia, maybe next week. So, can you tell me what is the main purpose the Russia and North Korea try to have a summit at this moment when negotiation with the United States, uh, North Korea has been had a lot, and then so yeah, what, do, what do you think about that? What is your from perspective? Can you tell that? Uh, thank you. This issue is very interesting last uh, time. Uh, I think uh, the, we, we do not need purpose because we have traditionally good relations with North Korea. So I just wonder why uh, the visit uh, is so late after <laughs> so many summits with other leaders. But uh, I would not expect practical results uh, from this summit. Because uh, Russia's strategy on the Korean Peninsula, as I already told, is not so active. So, and North Korea is cu currently needs uh, to balance China. And the only country which can do it is the United States, not Russia. Though some observers uh, point that uh, North Korea, after failed or uh, after the summit with the United States with uh, no results, 
uh, moved to Russia. But uh, I don't think. Uh, the only uh, mm, thing that can be discussed is a possible mediator role of Russia in um, current dialogue between United States and North Korea. But uh, it's difficult, this role is difficult to implement because of tense relations uh, between United States and Russia. So North Korea may trust Russia, but uh, United States does not. Uh, so, and I, I don't think there will be practical results. Even economic cooperation, if discussed, uh, it will be discussed for future, because now we can do nothing in this sanctions condition. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Sanyan Lee, a uh, visiting scholar from Sejo Institute in Korea. Uh, I have two questions. Um, you mentioned there's a new kind of a uh, regional security system. You mentioned the US, ROC, DPRK trilateral, uh, triangular relationship, and also China, ROC, DPRK triangular uh, relationship. But in my view, at least for, for the Northeast Asia, to think about any kind of a multilateral security mechanism. I think at least the US and China, both US and China uh, should agree. And in that context, uh, do you think particularly China and Russia uh, has some intention to work with the US to create such a mechanism? And second question is that, uh, interestingly, you mentioned that uh, those Korea's nuclear weapon may be weapon for both North and South Korea. <laughs> And even some South Korean people actually have argued that. But how much do you think that view can be endorsed by other nations like US and China, Russia? As for security mechanism by these three countries, I don't believe it's possible because too many contradictions in relations and uh, this uh, rivalry between United States and China and uh, between United States and Russia, uh, no points of contact. Uh, even uh, six party talks participants could not create security mechanism. And I, I don't think these three countries which are in rivalry <laughs> can create something like this. They have very different interests. Uh, as for uh, the nuclear weapons of North Korea common for all Koreans, uh, uh, it's not my opinion, it's uh, opinion of some South Korean experts and it's considered radical. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. But uh, we do not know all strategies and plans of South Korean government for future. Uh, it is a, a Korean uh, nation with uh, 5,000 uh, years history. So <laughs> maybe they have strategies for hundreds of years and we, don't, we cannot know it. And um, uh, of course, if um, the perfect model I described would be implemented, a uh, security mechanism with participation of United States and two Korean states, they will, will not need any nukes. But it's very difficult to implement. And maybe Koreans will decide to go another path. <laughs> Could I just go on the record as thinking that's a really terrible idea <laughs> for North Korea's nuclear weapons to be, uh, you know, taken up by a, put to be all uh, all Korean nuclear weapons? I I would really be surprised if other countries in the region could 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 agree to that. Uh, we want fewer nuclear weapons, not not more. One, as you rightly mentioned before, the NPT would have something to say about that. Yeah, you know, I mean, something actually like that could spell the end of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, which has kept the number of nuclear weapon states very low. I mean, we can talk all day long or all week long uh, about uh, um, problems with that treaty and implementation, but on the whole, it has been very successful in keeping nuclear risks lower. It's going to celebrate its uh, 50th anniversary next year. Um, I'm sure these issues, you know, North Korea's continuing nuclear weapons will be raised. And as a matter of fact, you know, North Korea is one of the 
Is it the only country that joined the treaty as a non-nuclear weapons state and then left and developed nuclear weapons? Iran is not in that category. Other countries, India, Pakistan, Israel, they never joined the treaty. So, so North Korea, from a non-proliferation perspective, presents very strong challenges to, you know, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Um, you know, we, we need to solve this issue. Um, my name is uh, Sylvia Mishra, and I'm a nuclear policy analyst. My first question is uh, for Sharon. Where do you situate uh, the North Korea's recent tactical uh, guided weapon test in its strategic uh, calculus and thinking? Where do you think uh, we go ahead from here? Because clearly it is an indication of the North Korean regime's uh, growing frustration with uh, Washington, D.C.'s inflexibility in negotiations. That is one. And my second question is for Anastasia. You mentioned uh, that uh, Russia is, uh, is seen or viewed as a trusted uh, partner of DPRK. Do you think uh, Russia would take a leading uh, role in trying to influence DPRK to sign and ratify the CTBT? It seems one of the lowest hanging uh, non -proliferation, act of non-proliferation measure that uh, North Korea can undertake. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. I think you kind of intimated in your question, you know, this is North Korea trying to get, kind of, you know, poke uh, the United States. It wasn't a nuclear weapons test. It wasn't a long-range ballistic missile test. You know, there are other things that it could have done. Uh, but it's, you know, a reminder to the United States, hello, uh, you need to deal with us, and we're serious about this. They can't be happy that the U.S. walked away from the last summit. So I think it's a, it's a tactical signal, a tactical test, a tactical signal. I think Russia and North Korea are more, uh, rather friends than partners, and uh, their relations uh, are specific. So Russia never presses on North Korea. That's why they have so good relations. They, uh, of course, uh, Russia can uh, persuade, but uh, do it very friendly without forcing North Korea to do something. It is not Russia. Maybe China will act more actively. Uh, what are the sources of leverage? Sorry, what are the sources of leverage that Russia would have over North Korea? Uh, mm. I think the only leverage is trust, because Russia never interfered in internal policy of North Korea. Uh, absence of leverage is, is good leverage in uh, Russian-North Korean relations. Just on the point about the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, Russia, Russia signed the treaty, right? <laughs> I mean, signed and ratified. The U.S. and China haven't. I mean, they've signed it but not ratified it. So it seems to me that it's in Russia's interest, very strong interest, mm -hmm. to get this treaty it, it, you know, into, uh, into force. Mm -hmm. To do that, you need North Korea, you need U.S., you need China. I mean, if, um, if I were the Russians, I'd be on a full court press to mm. make this happen. <laughs> uh, I, I think from North, North Korea can do just uh, after improvement of relations with the United States. Uh, you know, they just do not need uh, tests uh, for technical reasons. They already made all technical tests. They can make simulate them or make subcritical tests. But their purpose is demonstration. If North Korea is not satisfied with the process of dialogue, it can demonstratively <laughs> test something. So uh, I don't think they could be persuaded to join this treaty until there is no improvement in relations with the United States. OK, do we have any other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Jack Krapansky, uh, unaffiliated. Um, but I live in the uh, information vacuum here, so question about North Korea. Um, well, now I almost forgot it. Uh, back to unification. Do we have any sense of 
how they in North Korea view what are the characteristics that unification will bring about? I mean, what, what expectations they have that in 2020, is that like the, the end all or the uh, signing a treaty or starting a long process? You know, when do they expect something to be different? Uh, as I thought, I, I don't believe it will occur so fast. Uh, but maybe in 2020, uh, some more improvement in inter-career relations will occur, occur in some type of co new cooperation, maybe restoring some border trading zones, uh, uh, cross-border zones. Um, but... Uh, it's it's impossible even f uh, uh, reunification in uh, by this concept uh, one nation two political systems will take decades we we will not see it <coughs> that's why some experts consider it will never occur because uh, it will occur not alive <laughs> okay. um, do you have any concluding thoughts or um, I don't I just um, wanted to thank Anastasia for coming to CSIS for these months to pro for providing a really interesting perspective on these issues. I feel like in Washington we listen to each other uh, say the same things. Um, you know, if you're a North Korea expert, you know Sig Hecker's chart by heart. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, you know, I'm not sure I would call it an information vacuum, but um, certainly um, we tend to follow very kind of conventional routes for information. So I just want to thank you for, uh, you know, opening up the spectrum a little bit for us. And thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Anything you want to? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, thanks, uh, <coughs> thanks to you, dear Sharon. Thanks to our meeting in Mongolia, finally <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, so Mongolia make countries approach. Someone was there. Very efficient platform. Maybe that'll be the topic of our next meeting. Okay, thank you all for coming. Let's uh, give a hand to our panelists. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Thanks for coming back. <laughs>